Few mythical beasts loom larger in the human imagination than the dragon. No matter what form these scaly creatures take, or which folklore they come from, legends are almost always more captivating when they include these fantastical monsters. But what might the biology of a realistic order of dragons look like? Classic books like Dragonology and fictional documentaries like Discovery Channel's Dragon Special have entertained this hypothetical idea in the past. And I won't deny that I read and watched both of these series when I was younger more times than I can count. But I've always been looking for a more scientific take on these mythical creatures. Enter Draconology, a meticulously detailed spin on the concept that imagines dragons as a parareptilian offshoot which emerged millions of years ago and have survived until the modern day. The project was created by the artist Vikas Rao, and I have links to his work in this video's description. His Draconology series is unbelievably comprehensive, imagining the genetics, behavior, taxonomy, habitats, and even feeding habits of countless dragons inspired by cultures the world over. So for this entry into the archive, let's make our own dragon documentary and explore the awesome fictional science of Draconology. The world of Draconology is set on an alternate Earth, which saw the formation of a few additional landmasses and the evolution of numerous creatures that only exist in folklore on our own planet. Chief among these are the Draconomorpha, a branch of Parareptilia which includes sea serpents, worms, bird dragons like griffins, drakes, wyverns, and what the author calls true dragons, all of which are extremely well realized and will be covering in this video. First up are the sea serpents, or the Thalatophydia, an order of aquatic draconomorphs that are a sister lineage to their land-dwelling cousins. In the words of the author, the evolutionary origins of sea serpents are as murky as the waters they inhabit, but it seems their ancestry dates back well over 200 million years, and thanks to this alternate Earth having slightly different mass extinctions, some still roam its seas today. In wetlands, rivers, and estuaries throughout this world's version of Europe, you may encounter the Knucker, a long, eel-like serpent with sharp, slicing teeth. Averaging around 16 feet, or 5 meters in length, the Knuckers are actually on the small side for a sea serpent. The author imagines their flippers have a high degree of muscular development, allowing them to pull themselves onto land, similar to seals or sea lions. In mythology, the term Knucker was a common name for a water dragon, with a version of the term appearing in the 10th century epic poem Beowulf. Moving further out to sea, to the waters of the North Atlantic and Pacific, the northern sea orm glides through the waters, reaching almost 60 feet, or 18 meters in length, and weighing well over a ton, these creatures aren't built for speed but foraging in the ocean depths. The long tendrils on its snout, known as barbells, contain nerve endings that help sea orms detect vibrations made by swimming prey. The animal's head is also somewhat crocodilian, and has a similarly formidable bite force that aids in crushing its unlucky meals. And in the depths of the ocean, leviathans lurk. The two largest sea serpents are the Tiamat and the Jormungandr, examples of abyssal gigantism that get their names from ancient Mesopotamian and ancient Norse mythology. And these legendary titles are well deserved, for the largest of the Jormungandr have reached lengths of 82 feet or 25 meters, and the largest Tiamat not far behind at 68 or 21 meters. The author imagines these species are able to withstand the frigid depths they swim through thanks to a network of heat exchangers and a layer of thick blubber, which has allowed them to dive deep enough to feed on organisms like giant squids. In our next category we have the worms, long, wingless, quadrupedal draconomorphs. In many real-world cultures, dragon myths don't feature winged, fire-breathing monsters, but serpentine beings more often associated with water or earth, which this group takes inspiration from. In the forests of East and Southeast Asia, the wide-ranging great wind worms move through the canopy. Although they lack wings, this species is able to glide from tree branch to tree branch by flaring out their ribs and undulating their bodies in a serpentine motion. Such behavior is not dissimilar from the rib-powered flight of real-life draco lizards or the incredible gliding techniques of paradise tree snakes, both of which are unique animals I've touched on before in other entries. 
Another amazing worm dwells in various regions of North America, the Greater Banded Utena. At 14 feet or 4.5 meters, it's one of the mightiest species in its family. The Utena pays respects to the horned serpent motif that appears in the oral history of numerous indigenous cultures, particularly the Cherokee people. Able to produce venom from a specialized gland in its upper jaw, the Utena is similar to the real-world horned viper, one of the deadliest snakes alive today. Our third category are the Amazing Bird Dragons, or Orinthro Draconia. This diverse order includes numerous mythical creatures you might be familiar with. In West Asia, North Africa, and Southern Europe, for example, you can find the common cockatrice, a unique opportunistic forager that will eat just about anything. In conventional mythology, cockatrices hatch from a chicken egg that was incubated by a toad. Here, the author imagines the myth comes from a behavioral quirk of these reptiles to lay their eggs in burrows dug out by certain species of burrowing toads or lizards. A strikingly tall bird dragon is the giant Kirin, a heavy, flightless draconomorph so tall it could look a giraffe in the eye. These unique, brightly colored organisms are actually inspired by mythical chimerical creatures in various East Asian cultures, and have gone by numerous names. And the final member of the bird dragons are the griffins, a family so diverse they require their own separate section. Called the Griffonidae, these offshoots have a superficial resemblance to birds, but their feathers are in fact epidermal scales that have evolved into fur-like colofibers. In the forests of Atlantis, a fictional island landmass, you need to stay on the lookout for the Atlantean giant alk. These species are the heaviest of the griffin family, to the point where they've given up the ability to fly. Giant alk are also hypocarnivorous, meaning their diet is mostly composed of plants rather than meat, similar to many species of bear. Soaring over the ocean with a wingspan similar to that of an albatross, the southern Axax is one of the smallest members of the griffin family. These creatures are opportunistic scavengers, primarily feeding on carcasses and filling an ecological niche almost like a sea-going vulture. In this scene from the North Pacific, a northern Axax, a closer relative of their southern cousins, feeds on the washed-up body of a right whale, which a great white shark has also laid claim to. And the final bird dragon we'll be examining is the Lemurian giant Axex, another species which lives on a fictional island landmass. The largest of the griffin species, though not quite as heavy as the Atlantean elk, the giant Axex stands at over six and a half feet or two meters tall. This particular griffin also feeds in shallow waters, with a feeding ecology similar to storks or herons. In our next category, we have the drakes, or Therosuchia. These heavyset, flightless draconomorphs are closely related to what the artist terms true dragons, which we'll get to in a bit. The author imagines most drakes are semi-aquatic, growing to gargantuan sizes, feeding on vast schools of fish. The largest of these species, the titan drake, is a giant among giants, reaching lengths of up to 52 feet or 16 meters and weighing over 9 tons, making them proportional in size to a T-Rex. Further out to sea, the swift makara have become even more aquatic, growing a long tail fluke to aid in pursuing prey under the waves in coordinated pods. On occasion, Makara will even attempt to catch their distant cousins, the sea serpents, as you can see here in this high-speed underwater chase. While the Makara are fast, most species of sea serpents have better endurance, making this a tight race for survival. And now we've arrived at an amazing category of flying draconiforms. These are the wyverns, or Volanosauria, an order that is famous not for breathing fire, but for being highly venomous. At first glance, these flying reptiles seem to resemble our next category of true dragons more than drakes or bird dragons, but the wyverns are actually most closely related to certain worms. On various island chains, the greater frogmouth wyvern flits among the trees, feeding on small birds and reptiles. Although capable of flight, frogmouth wyvern's wings, like the wings of most wyverns, lack the air sacs that allow true dragons to achieve liftoff despite their far greater sizes. As a result, frogmouth wyverns have stayed relatively tiny, not much larger than a crow. And no, despite their name, frogmouth wyverns aren't imagined as being related to actual frogs. 
In the Amazon rainforest, the much larger peacock wyverns also achieve flight, with wingspans reaching over 5 feet or 1.5 meters. One notable trait of this species is their lethal venom glands, which produce a deadly, fast-acting neurotoxin. To attract mates, peacock wyverns also possess bright, flashy colors, much like real-world peacocks. And the largest wyvern in this fictional taxonomy is the New Guinean giant wyvern, apex predators whose wingspans get close to 10 feet or 3 meters in length. Like most wyverns, these creatures also possess potent venom, enabling them to hunt animals many times their size. Impressive as these creatures are, however, true dragons can grow far larger. Before we discuss the category of what the artist calls true dragons, however, I need to address a misconception I've often seen online regarding the difference between wyverns and dragons that I may be a bit too passionate about. I've often seen people claim that any dragon with two legs is automatically a wyvern, which, okay, obviously both dragons and wyverns aren't real, so who cares? But if we're going off mythology as a precedent, this division is far from universal. The number of limbs dragons in medieval art have are all over the place, despite the misconception that dragons always had four legs and two wings and wyverns always had two legs and two wings. Though wyverns usually had two legs, dragons in myth often had any number of legs and yet could still be identified as proper dragons. If medieval myth is your basis, I think a better distinction is that wyverns, unlike dragons, usually couldn't breathe fire and were instead venomous. The notion of a hard division between dragons and wyverns based on legs alone is actually a very recent and kind of subjective one. So if you want your dragon to have four legs, awesome, but if you want them to have two, that doesn't automatically make them wyverns. Again, all of this is made up and I know my feelings on this are unusually strong. Okay, back on track. At last, we've come to the fire-breathing Eudraconia, often called true dragons in this taxonomy, who you'll notice have two legs and yet aren't wyverns. Among the ranks of these dragons are the large, fire-breathing behemoths you'd expect, but also smaller, more specialized species. The green dragonet, for example, is a diminutive dragon that, isolated on the Solomon Islands, has adopted a curious diet of raw fruits. Despite being smaller than some wyverns, the green dragonet still counts as a true dragon thanks to the brachial air sacs on its wing, and because it retains the fire-breathing abilities of its larger cousins. Near the rivers and wetlands of the fictional landmass of Lemuria, the gargantuan Lemurian Dracolisk is on the prowl. Despite having a wingspan of 44 feet or 3.5 meters, the Dracolisk spends most of its time patrolling the water's edge looking for food, and has actually taken up an ecological niche not unlike a hippopotamus, if hippos were carnivores that hunted prey by setting them aflame, that is. But how do the dragons of this world produce their fire breath? The creator of this project imagined the process began begins internally, starting by combining endogenously produced phyrophoric compounds in a specialized reaction chamber located in the throat. The creatures then forcibly expel this mixture outwards, producing a powerful jet of flame, almost like a biological flamethrower. And the most impressive fire breather of all is the Eurasian Mountain Devil, a megafaunal predator with a wingspan of almost 50 feet, or 15 meters. These behemoths hunt by dive-bombing prey from above, ending the short-lived chase with a quick burst of fire. In build, the Eurasian Mountain Devil almost reminds me of some modern reconstructions of pterosaurs, although this dragon is larger than even the mightiest of that extinct group. In the skies, the Mountain Devils are unmatched, as you can see one here scaring off two griffin with a jet of ominous flame, a truly intimidating creature. You can find more species and scientific details on Vicus Rao's site using the links below. I'd like to give a special shout out to Ernesto Marrero, who I believe was my 19th subscriber and the first person ever to give me a suggestion for a video, back when I was averaging less than 10 views an entry. His request was for a video on dragons and I feel it's only right I finally delivered. So thank you Ernesto, it's because of you and fans like you that I make these videos in the first place. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support. And like, subscribe, and hit the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.